Welcome to The Bid, where we break down what's happening in the markets and explore the forces changing the economy and finance. I'm your host, Ann Ackerley, head of BlackRock's Retirement Group. As we continue this mini-series during Women's History Month, The Bid welcomes four senior female leaders of BlackRock and their guests for four special crossover episodes in partnership with my colleague Samara Cohen's LinkedIn video series, In Progress. I'm excited to continue this mini-series as I speak to another incredible leader about progress and purpose. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Lucy Marcel. Lucy is an Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Associate Director for Economic Mobility at Boston Medical Center. She is the co-founder and Executive Director of Boston Medical Center's Street Cred Program, a nonprofit providing anti-poverty financial services in pediatric waiting rooms. Dr. Marcel is also a TED Fellow and the recipient of the American Academy of Pediatrics Ann E. Dyson Child Advocacy Award. Wow, Dr. Marcel, welcome and thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Ann. I'm very happy to be here. Why don't you tell us about Street Cred and the work you're doing there? So Street Cred is a program designed to help improve financial well-being as a part of pediatric well-child care. We focus mostly on infants in the first year of life because that's when we have the most access. They come in and see us seven times. And at each of those visits, we deliver a bundle of economic services focused on building economic stability and asset building so that children and their families can be healthier and thrive. We currently have about 225 babies enrolled in this program, and we've been operating since 2016. One of the services we provide is tax preparation. We've done about 6,000 tax returns and returned $14 million to families. I mean, wow. Talk about meeting people where they are. What prompted you to start this program? Really, it was a patient-driven innovation. As a pediatrician, I see every day that health problems kids come to me with are often driven more by their environment, their life circumstances than the biology within their bodies. So for example, a child with asthma might keep coming back with asthma flares because the housing in which they live has a lot of mold in it, or there's air pollution in the environment around them. I give them an asthma inhaler, but it only temporarily helps. It doesn't really fix the problem. And sometimes parents can't even afford that inhaler. I was frustrated by this and felt like we really need to address one of the root causes, which is poverty or financial instability. I knew that there is a tax credit called the Earned Income Tax Credit that is the largest cash transfer program available in this country, but that 20% of families don't get it at all. And 60% of families who do miss out on hundreds of dollars because they go to for-profit tax preparers. In 2015, a colleague and I started talking to patients about this, trying to find out, do they get this credit? Do they know about it? How do they get it? found a lot of mothers were not getting it. They didn't know about it. They maybe weren't even filing their taxes. We started trying to refer families to community-based free tax sites, thinking that would be a great solution. We had a mom who took her infant and toddler on two buses and a train across town to this tax site. It was closed. She went back the next week because she was determined and found out that she was missing a key piece of documentation so they couldn't do her taxes. But when she came back for her baby's next visit, she said, I have to come here all the time. Why couldn't you have just done this here for me? Why did you have to send me across town? So she inspired this work. We thought that's really smart of you to want to do something that makes better use of your time in a place you have to go anyway. So we started doing taxes. And then over time, wanted to build on that and incorporate other underutilized financial services that could get families cash, things like food supports, food stamps paid family leave, college savings accounts for children, asset building tools through housing, and that's where we're at now. It's such an incredible story and in some ways so obvious and in other ways so not obvious that you could do this. But as I think about it, packaging financial services with pediatric care 
really requires trust. How did you begin to build trust with your patients in what you were doing and in this program? Luckily, patients generally trust their doctors, which is what we wanted to take advantage of. People are used to talking to their doctors about very sensitive topics, but money isn't usually one of them. So we weren't totally sure if that trust would translate and kind of took a leap of faith and started asking patients, would you want to talk to us about this? And interestingly, there have been a couple surveys now done. About 70% of families say, I do want to talk to my doctor about my financial status, and they recognize that impacts both their physical and their mental health. So we took advantage of that pre-existing trust, and then we made sure in our model to build in longitudinal in-person relationships. We know that that really matters for trust, having that in-person connection, meeting someone every time they come in to a visit. We found that that really helps build trust. And the other thing that's very important and probably obvious is that we focus on trying to have a team that reflects the patient population we serve. So making sure that we have shared language capacity, shared cultural background as much as possible so that patients feel like they can relate to the people who are serving them. Now, you talked a little bit about the connection of health and wealth, that people are willing to talk about money with doctors. So interesting. Where are you starting to see success in this connection, bridging health and wealth? And as you think about the work that you're doing, how do you think it's going to impact your patients' families and their futures? So I think there are a couple examples. The first is taxes. That's what we've done the longest. And we certainly have found that an average get families back $2,500 to $3,000. But we can do up to three years of past tax returns. For some families, we get them $10,000 back at once. And that clearly has a huge economic impact. But it's not just the immediate money that they get back. It's also the accumulation of the effect. So we educate people about the fact that the earned income tax credit is actually designed to encourage work. The more you work up to a certain amount, the more money you get back. The maximum credit is about $6,600. And then it plateaus. This is very different than most public benefits like, say, food stamps, which every dollar you earn decreases the amount of food stamps you get. One example, I had a mom, dinner taxes, she's working part-time for the government. She said to me, Afterwards, wow, I didn't realize if I work more, I get more of this credit back. I'm going to ask my boss tomorrow if I can work more hours. That is empowering to her. And it also is going to have an accumulative effect so that over time, as she works more hours, she makes more money, there's more economic stability in her family over years. Another example would be the 529 college savings accounts we've been helping patients open. Our state, Massachusetts, as well as I would say about half of the states in this country now offer an incentive to open an account. So here in Massachusetts, if you open an account in the first year of life, the state will put $50 in, which isn't a ton of money, but certainly it's an incentive. Most of our patients have not actually ever invested money. So there are a lot of barriers to families taking advantage of this. Nationally, families who have 529 accounts tend to be white, college educated, and higher income earners. The families I serve, 90% of them are in Medicaid, about 40% of them are immigrants or English is not their first language, very low income populations. Majority of them identify as either Black, Hispanic, or Latina. Definitely do not fit the demographic profile of the typical 529 account holder. We have found in our work opening 529 accounts that we're able to get about 20% of families opening accounts compared to about 3% nationally who hold these accounts. And we know that having a college savings account, even if there isn't money in the account or there's only a dollar in the account, is associated with three times increased likelihood of going to college and a similar increase in likelihood of graduating from college. There's a study in Oklahoma that showed when the state put money into these accounts. It was associated with a decrease in maternal depression and an improvement in child socio-emotional well-being at age four. And that clearly is before they have access to the money. So you might wonder why. Our thought is that it gives families hope and it creates a growth mindset, the sense that someone is investing in their family and that their child does have a chance for a better future. So our hope in helping families open these accounts is that there will be a similar effect down the road. Parents are very enthusiastic about helping their children build a better life.
wow, there was so much in there about the impact that you're having. And it makes me think a lot about getting people the information they need when they need it to empower them is just so important. And removing some of the frictions that keep people from taking these actions. Maybe switching subjects just a little bit. You work with women every single day. It's a Women's History Month. But can you talk a little bit about some of the discrepancies that you've seen both medically and financially with respect to women? And how do you think we can overcome them? That's such an important topic. And there's a lot of work to be done in this area. The vast majority of parents that I see are women and women identifying. We certainly see some parents who identify as non-binary or who are men, but probably 90% of the parents I interact with identify as women. They face a disproportionate burden of childcare in terms of the impact on their bodies. They have been pregnant, they have given birth, and also in terms of after having the children. Many of the parents, well not all of them that I see, are raising children by themselves. So there may be a partner who is involved but doesn't live with them, or there may not be a partner involved at all. Often there's multi-generational family members helping parents take care of their children, but the mother has the primary responsibility, which I think is probably on average true around the world. That is a lot of responsibility on their bodies, but also on their physical lives. And understandably, that takes a toll on their health. Pregnancy is inherently risky. It is associated with worse health than not being pregnant. There's a risk of death. And as you've probably seen in the headlines nationally, Black women in particular, even when they're wealthy and well-educated, are at increased risk of death from pregnancy and postpartum. But Having a child also impacts ability to work. Unfortunately, in this country, we do not have access to good, affordable childcare for many families. On a daily basis, I see moms who really want to be working. They want to have a career. They understand not only that it's important for their family's economic stability, but for their own development and growth, but they can't afford childcare. Or they have a job that has erratic hours, and that's a huge barrier. Unfortunately, many women I see quit their jobs when they're pregnant because of the health problems they're having and because they know they're not going to be able to have childcare with the intent to start working again later. We know for women across the economic spectrum that quitting jobs then leads to backsliding in terms of wage potential and career trajectory. So it's kind of a depressing picture I just painted, but I do think there's a lot we can do. One example is in Massachusetts, we do now have paid family medical leave. It's a state policy, depending on the specific situation, a woman can get up to six months of leave, both for medical problems and for taking care of a new child. Non-birthing parents can also get paid family leave. So this is a super important policy that unfortunately we are seeing inequities in how it's being accessed. A lot of the parents I work with don't know about it and they're not taking advantage of it. And then the last thing I'll say about this is that educating and empowering women around these topics is really critical. We actually right now are running a financial coaching group for parents. All the parents who are participating identify as women and they have told us how empowering it is to have this financial knowledge, but also to have an hour a week where they are not primarily taking care of their children. We're providing childcare during these sessions and are just able to connect with other adults and think about adult topics like their finances. Financial literacy is something that could be embedded into many aspects of our society, and unfortunately it's not, and so it's something that we could be doing more of. going through my mind so much is the impact of childbearing and child caring on women that isn't just in the moment when they're having their kids or their kids are young, but it actually follows them all the way through their life. And I'm the head of retirement and think a lot about women in retirement and this notion that women have to take off and not always have paid work to care for children winds up showing when they get to retirement The money that they've been able to save is often, at least in America, 30, 35% lower than men. 
So this is something that continues throughout their lives. And I'm so with you on, we need more paid childcare and we need to make it easier for women to work and to have children. So much in there. And I love that you're empowering women with knowledge that they're able to use to make their lives better. So moving on, one of the themes of Women's History Month, the series that we're doing is really about purpose. And so how do you think about the purpose in the work that you're doing? That's a great question. My foundational belief is that everyone deserves the opportunity to have a good life. Right now, our society is structured such that that is not the case. At birth, some children are inherently unlikely to thrive because of their race, their economic status, their family composition. And so the purpose of my work is to change that fact, not just because it's the right thing to do ethically. I mean, it definitely is. And that is my primary driver, but also because it's the right thing for our country. We cannot continue to thrive as a society when a substantial minority of our population is struggling economically and in respect to their health. There is a huge financial case for this that you probably understand better than I do. There are great economic losses when we have this chunk of our population that isn't thriving economically, that isn't healthy, and children that are then not going to grow up and be able to contribute to the workforce and have health problems. There is a financial case for that, and as well as the kind of human rights argument. But that's the purpose of my work. Stay tuned because BlackRock is soon to publish a report about if we could fix some of these things, the impact of women in the workforce and what it could contribute to the overall economy. So you're right, this is the right thing to do, but it's also important for our country in terms of continuing to be able to grow and make sure everybody can have the lives that they want to live. I would imagine that it might actually take time to see the impact of what you're doing. How do you think about progress and measuring success? Right. What you just said is so true about pediatrics in general, that we struggle to quantify the impact of our work because often you don't see it for another 18 years. Children in general are relatively healthy compared to adults, so they're not that expensive to take care of. Health insurance and healthcare systems don't invest as much in them as a result because there isn't that upfront cost and they don't want to pay for something they're not going to see a return on for 18 years. So part of it is just faith in the process. I know that investing in making sure an infant is at a healthy weight, is getting good nutrition, is being emotionally nurtured appropriately, is going to lead to a healthier, thriving adult. But I also rely in the short term on the numbers of people we're serving and the metrics, how many tax returns we've done, how many accounts we've opened, how many connections we've made, as well as direct feedback from families. So I am a practicing clinician. I see patients on a daily basis and they often spontaneously give me feedback on the work that we're doing. And so that in itself, regardless of what happens in 18 years, in the moment, it's been empowering to that family and that matters. So I put all those things together and feel assured that the work we're doing is important and has an impact. I'm so inspired by what you're doing. As we come to an end, what piece of advice would you give your younger self starting off in your career? I think I would tell myself to stick with my gut and to follow my convictions. I say that because I, when I was young, as a child and a young adult, I actually had the least self-doubt. I was very confident and sure of my vision and what I was going to do. Medical training is a system that's really designed to mold physicians into a very specific career path and build specific characteristics. I don't exactly fit that mold. I'm a bit of a entrepreneur and innovator. And throughout that process, I did get feedback that maybe I should try to be a bit more traditional. And it took me on a journey of doubting my convictions and trying to conform. But then coming back more recently to that conviction, to follow my gut and my vision. So I would just say that believing in that internal clarity that you have is really important and not to get dissuaded by others. 
That is great advice. And thank goodness you are following your gut because you're doing really terrific work. I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing and really thank you for all the time you've given us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to be here. And I've learned a lot from you too. And I'm excited to read that report that you mentioned that's coming out soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Bid. If you haven't already, check out the previous episodes in this four-part miniseries featuring some other inspiring female leaders as we celebrate Women's History Month. And make sure you subscribe to The Bid wherever you get your podcasts. This material is intended for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice, a recommendation or an offer or solicitation to purchase or sell any securities, funds or strategies to any person in any jurisdiction in which an offer, solicitation, purchase or sale would be unlawful under the securities laws of such jurisdiction. The opinions expressed are as of the date of publication and are subject to change without notice. Reliance upon information in this material is at the sole discretion of the listener. Investing involves risks. BlackRock does and may seek to do business with companies covered in this podcast. As a result, listeners should be aware that the firm may have a conflict of interest that could affect the objectivity of this podcast. For more information, visit blackrock.com forward slash the bid.